so yeah, Bayer Leverkusen 3, Bayern Munich 0. Uh, guys, we've got so much to talk about. Um, I want to shine a light on Xabi Alonso and the amazing work he's done at uh, Leverkusen. But I think first and foremost, we really have to touch on how Bayern Munich and Thomas Tuchel in particular approached this game. Um, Seb, it seems fair to me to say that it was quite an unorthodox lineup. It was a back three. Um, we had uh, Sasha Bowie uh, as a left back. Um you know, Kimmich missing, uh, obviously through injury or um, fitness issues. So a kind of, you know, ad hoc midfield as well. And, you know, there's there's a lot of factors that go into these games and these performances, especially at this level where the margins are so small. But I think a lot of Barn fans probably walked away from that game thinking the club almost kind of shot themselves in the foot before a ball had been kicked. Yeah, it was interesting as well because Tiggle kind of doubled down on it afterwards, Stefan, said, well, no, I picked the same team again. And if you look at the pattern of that game, I remember seeing the, the Bayern lineup and thinking that's asking an awful lot of Pavlovich like, to be the kind of the platform because Goretzka, to me, Goretzka is an eight. He needs a, an orchestrator behind him. He needs a kind of a stable base. And I don't feel like Pavlovich is quite experienced enough to have provided that good player that he, he's clearly going to become. Um and everything looked very awkward. And I'm glad you mentioned the Sasha Bowie decision because, goodness, he looked awkward out on the left. He just, he looked, because, I mean, at times he had, obviously, Stanisic playing against him, but Teller drifting out wide as well. And everywhere you looked in that Bayern side, there was disconnection space. Uh, and it was it was remarkably easy, like, for Leverkusen to play through them. I think when, like, when you have a game like that, which has been anticipated for months you expect it to be a little bit cagey, even though we know how Leverkusen play, you expect a little bit of inhibition. And yet there was none of that. It was so easy um, to the point where it was actually quite shocking. Um, and then W. So when Tickle kind of refuses to sort of acknowledge, okay, maybe like, even though he clearly wasn't fit, Kimmich might've been the better option there. Guerrero, you could have played as a kind of a sick, potentially just for a bit of experience. Uh, it just, it was a, an absolute mess. Yeah, what do you think about the decision to play Dyer at central defence? Because you know, I, I took one look at that lineup. I was actually doing some TV work go, uh, ahead of the game, and I was on camera before we went live, and the lineups literally came in like thirty seconds before we went on, and I had the producer in my ear saying, "What do you think of that lineup?" But I had it looked at on my phone, and I, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. To be perfectly honest with you, it's just obviously you, they do these things like in a numerical order, so you're trying to like add up this central defenders and fullbacks and the only kind Do, of doing a bit of tv producer in my ear who's this who's this that we're talking to tonight international bundesliga pundit uh extraordinaire Just, uh, can only confirm you, that exa exactly the same conversations were taking place in the uh in the in the media center at, yeah. at, the, at the bayer Vida when the when the the team dropped i found myself as well yeah in, in a packed media center looking down that line i'm thinking that's that looks like five at the back Looks like a back three. Looks like potentially Eric Dyer in a sort of um, sweeper libero role. And yeah, so it so it proved. He, I think the thinking behind Tuchel's decision was to go, yeah, to to match Leverkusen's five at the back. But of course, Alonso Alonso himself had made the change to to far at the back, which immediately rendered that um, problematic. And then yeah, as it as it then developed throughout the first half, Seb's already mentioned how out of place uh, Sasha Bowie looked thought he looked solid against Gladbach when he came on for his debut but he was in his favourite position at right back I was sat next to a colleague from the Munich uh, Abendzeitung and he was, she said straight away before the ball was kicked Bowie you know, away from his favourite position this is potentially problematic and as it proved um, you mentioned him being up against um, Stanisic and Teller at times, and they actually double teamed him at one point. I think down by the touchline, they, they they literally teamed up on him physically to to win the ball. So that was that was problematic all the way through. Eric Dyer gave the ball away in several dangerous occasions. You know, it, it, trying to open play, trying to launch Bayern's build up, and balls were going astray. There were longer balls where he clearly wasn't on the same wavelength with either um with either Kim Min Jae or uh, Bellway on the left. It, it didn't work from start to finish. And then as we might get onto it in a sec later, Tuchel didn't change to half time either, which was also which was also baff also baffling. Yeah. The weird thing I found as well that 
the, the, the baffling context of all this is that he's got a perfectly good left back sitting on the bench in Guerrero. You know, it's not as if obviously Davies is missing, which is one of the best left backs in the world, um, left wing back, whatever you want to call him. Um, and obviously, no one's going to do the job that Davies did. But Guerrero's a player who's been doing that job, admittedly, rather inconsistently for Dortmund over the years. But there's a reason that they signed him. And I think I said uh, to Manu on the on the video we did on YouTube after the game. They didn't sign Guerrero to be a number six. They signed him because he could obviously fill in a left back when necessary. Um, of course, he can play number six. He did a decent job of that for Dortmund last season. But Seb, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I maybe overthinking this and thinking, you know, this is it was almost Mourinho esque and like that kind of obtuse kind of decision to play a stubborn start at eleven just to kind of bite your tongue or, or bite your thumb at the the board almost, you know, to say, well. You guys have you guys have signed me this left back, but he's not good enough. So I'm going to play this right back in place, and I'm going to use this, you know, Eric Dyer, this kind of back backup of the backup central defender as my star defender in this game. And it felt very much like he was almost. I, I still can't, for the life of me, try and figure out why he was trying to put these kind of round pegs in a square hole, or or vice versa. That there's no, there doesn't. I still can't seem to see the logic behind it. Well, I, I don't have such a problem with Dyer because I think clearly like his best days are probably behind him. Um, and he's a very middling centre-back at best. But if you can surround him with a bit of pace and you just use him to distribute and the options ahead of him exist, he can be effective. The boy one, I have a bit more of a problem with because I think, like you touched on the right, Guerrero is signed as a, as a full-back or a wing-back. But within the context of a single game, like, Guerrero's versatility allows you to be much more agile tactically. Like you can do different things with him because you can push him in field if you need to. You can push him out wide. Fantastic set piece option. I felt like if I, I felt like the, the, the decision to put Boy in that position in this game is kind of irresponsible because you, you've bought a player. He hasn't been at a club of this size. Like what Galatasaray is a very large club, I understand that. But in terms of like a significant, a, a significant game within a major league, he hasn't played in that kind of, on that kind of occasion before. And you put him in a situation where he's probably destined to fail against one of the most dynamic teams in European football. I feel like whatever your motive, that's not the right thing to do. Because you've, you've invested 30 million euros in a player and all of a sudden you, you've kind of hung him out to dry with the fan base. Um, Time will tell if that's the case, where he gets the opportunity to redeem himself. But it was very strange. I, I, so much of Tuchel's demeanor is about kind of. I'm not sure what the right word is, but he, he's kind of he's so volatile and he's so. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the best word, Stefan. Yeah, I, I, it's it's maddening, and and like sometimes he does that thing where at the end of a disappointing performance, he throws his hands up in front of the media and goes, "I don't know why it's happened." I don't know why. He did, I remember it, it did him doing that as a Super Cup and just thinking, what weird tone to set for this season. Because you see that at Chelsea too. And it's it's strange. I can't... I still don't really understand the logic behind any of it. Um, it it still doesn't make sense. 24 hours later. he's He's been a he's been a difficult personality to deal with wherever he's been in his career. I think it's not often been one of his great strengths. Um, I wouldn't take that away from him. Um, but it can certainly, it certainly doesn't look right in terms of the optics, and I, I accept that that's not his main concern. He would argue as well that he, he doesn't care. Um, but it's not particularly good luck, uh, particularly when you do, by, you know, by the very nature of the role, have a quite media-facing presence, and you have to deal with the questions. Sometimes it comes off for him. I think back to the game that Seb, me and you were at in Dortmund earlier this year, when Bayern had won away with a 4-0 win, and... Yeah, Tuchel was justified and vindicating all his decisions. And if anything, he played he played that wrong as well by going overly, you know, so overly offensive and aggressive in his his media dealings, repeating in about five or six interviews how "Don't ask me, ask the experts," because you're clearly all idiots. Um, and yeah, so I'm like laughing in hindsight, but um, he was taking a similarly aggressive stance with the with the media yesterday in Leverkusen, I think breaking off breaking off one interview with Sportschau. Um, by effectively threatening a bet with the reporter regarding uh, the the build up to the opening goal. Now, maybe he's got a point because he was you know, the, the reporter was arguing you know, Bayern have conceded this sort of goal before, and Leverkusen have scored this sort of goal before, where the ball is played quickly across the box and the the wing back on the far side gets up quickly to provide the extra option. 
and Tuchel was arguing what you're suggesting you you in that you predicted um, the the number six drifting out the left, firing a ball through the through Dario Pomacano's legs to the uh, to the right back on the on the far side. Yeah, I, I'll bet you've never seen that before. So it def- descended into this really, really um, uh, overly detailed. A quite unpleasant argument in front of the press in the middle of an interview, where you, where you think, "Who who are you? Who are you really helping here with that with that sort of approach?" Matt, did you find it weird that he picked that hill to die on? Because it was like the first goal is that happens because you've put a player in an unfamiliar role, like and Boy doesn't react quickly enough, and you know he's in an awkward position, so that's what you'd expect. That is not the place to pick a fight. If you're Thomas Tuchel, because like you're right, like the the circumstances leading up to that are unfamiliar and it's not typical. But like reactive defending depends on players understanding what's around them, and you've asked someone to do something that he's not comfortable doing. It's it's a crazy argument to pick. Absolutely. First of all, there was that. First of all, I mean, just to maybe absolve Sasha Bowie from blame as well a little bit. He was to blame for that, but he wasn't the only Bayern defender who who, who fell asleep um, for, from from that throw in. That ball shouldn't be getting that far in the first place. But yeah, he is also a fault for completely losing track of of Stanisic. But it also wasn't the only hill that Tuchel picked to to, to die on. It seemed to be an almost planned defence from some of the Bayern staff and hierarchy post match that they've actually been really in the game for fifteen minutes. And the different fifteen minutes to what I watched. I, <laughs> Me I, too. I, 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 I even I, I actually I, that expression that you've just made, sir, with, with your eyes. <laughs> I, 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 I made that I made that expression yeah. directly with eye contact to Jan Christian Dresen, who was be, the CEO, <laughs> who was speaking to the press afterwards in the mixer, and he made it. He said, "Oh, fifteen minutes. We're actually really, we're really in the game." I looked at him and caught his eye and went, "Eh." Mm. Uh, what, what game were you watching? <laughs> but you know, that's why he's the finance man and not uh, not on the touchline. But you know, Tuchel also repeated that line that oh, we're in the game for fifteen minutes. If Bayern were, Bayern were in the game for eight minutes, according to my notes, and that only because Leverkusen was slowly finding their way into playing with a back four. That's the only reason. Um, so for Tuchel to pick to pick these hills to die on, it, it was it was strange and not particularly helpful for his own cause. Because we'll get onto it later. He's, as much as he got it wrong on Saturday, he's not Bayern's big issue at the moment. Yeah. Well, that's a bigger topic. Yeah. The interesting thing as well is um, I previewed this show, uh, this show, previewed this game um, with the excellent Marie Schulte Bochum um, last week, and we discussed Tuchel's kind of personality issues. And one of the points I made was that the fascinating thing with Tuchel is that he has such an obvious admiration for Pep Guardiola tactically, uh, the way he tries to maybe hold himself as this kind of, um, you know, head coach that uh, clubs bring in to build projects around. But the one thing that they can't contrast so starkly with, in my opinion, I mean, Seb, jump in if you disagree, because you obviously cover the Premier League a lot more than I do, but Pep um, in public bends over backwards to almost avoid confrontation to an extent. You know, if if if, 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 if this game had happened... Um, you know, uh, for a Pep Guardiola team, he'd come out and say, "Well, you know what, Bayern Leverkusen are the best, they're the, the best team in the world, they're the absolute best." And when uh, the question was asked of Sasha Boy, he'd say, "Look, he's, what, he's the best defender there was, the best left. Like he's fantastic. He played really well. He played really, really well." And, you know, there's probably some examples where he does contradict that kind of general rule of thumb, but it's almost like a cliche now in, in English football that Pep more or less flat up lies on camera to protect his players in public. Now, what happens in the changing room, completely different, and maybe that's where him and Tuchel are very similar. But where, um, and of course, you could probably argue that Pep's probably had far more comfortable jobs than Tuchel, so, uh, you know, there's different circumstances there. But I I tend to find that when it comes to almost like the PR of being a top-class head coach, Guardiola seems to have that more or less tied down. He knows how to avoid these questions. He knows how to avoid falling into the traps that these kind of post-match interviews put on him. And it's not easy because we've seen, for example, Jurgen Klopp falls into them all the time. But Tuchel, whether out of um, choice or simply because of his personality style, he just can't seem to help himself. And it seems to mean, and it means that he does, he gets into these kind of public spats with, you know, as Matt said in the show, you know, whereas Haman or uh, Lothar Mateus, but... Even this season alone, he's basically got into these kind of weird public spats with his own players where week to week he's having this constant debate about whether Yosha Kimmich's a number six. 
I, I just feel like we would never get that with Pep Guardiola. Sib. I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but it's weird that he has such admiration for Pep, but there's that glaring oversight from Tuchel. I feel he's a more emotional human being than Guardiola. Like Guardiola as a person, I think is quite strange. Uh, <laughs> I think is well, he, he is. He's he's quite an odd bloke. No, you're right. He, he's like he's a little he's, psychotic. He's awkward and well, so, so the, the, the best coaches are by the very name. Yeah, yeah. and it's kind of it's, it's a prerequisite, coach. really. Like well, if you're if you're that obsessive and that deal detail orientated, and I think a lot of I think a lot of the mystique around Guardiola comes from him saying weird things to be weird, and the media interpreting that as some kind of you know as if it has some sort of deeper significance. Like there's that, you mentioned it, Stefan, the trait he has of like, you know, before he's about to face a team who are really about to get a hammering, he praises them as the very best team that's ever played the game. Like I remember him doing that to Sarri's Napoli and uh, I remember him praising Dante all those years ago and saying he wanted like a thousand Dantes in his team and he'd never lose a game again. Tuchel to me, I think one of the problems for him is, unlike Guardiola, who's associated with um, an epoch-changing football team and a style of the game, like Tuchel's been very successful. Um, gonna see he nearly took Paris Saint Germain to a, a Champions League title. Can you imagine taking that circus to the top of European football? Like it's an incredible achievement potentially. On, and so, on crutches as well. What's that? On crutches. On crutches <laughs> as well. Like so at the same time though, I don't think kind of he has the same level of gravitas. So when he talks and when he's a bit weird, I think people focus in on the kind of the oddity of it rather than necessarily what they do with Guardiola which is to kind of lean into the kind of well he's just he's sort of like a this slightly opaque genius who's impossible to, in, to comprehend um but it is like I remember I remember when he when he moved to Chelsea everybody's saying everybody's talking back to kind of the difficulties he's had he'd had politically at Dortmund some of the difficulties he had at Paris Saint-Germain and thinking you're going to Chelsea really and you're going to deal with the kind of the the currents in that in that swimming pool and then Bayern Munich is another deeply political club, and it's it, Matt hit the nail on the head. He is not the problem at Bayern, but he's kind of an accelerant, isn't he? Like that personality of his. I wonder if, as well, he, he he's almost again. This is not to overly defend Thomas Tuchel. I think he he absolutely comes out of this weekend particularly badly for various reasons. Um, but I wonder if he's also a little bit of a victim of the yeah the ongoing the ongoing switch around. At the moment, of uh, Bayern and the, particularly the lack of a one well, of the lack of a sporting director because he's there, Christoph Freund, but a sporting director who's still finding his feet. Christoph Freund, uh, who didn't is, appoint him as well. Did, I, I didn't appoint him, yeah. yeah. But also has, t- has taken his time in settling into the role, increasing his visibility and his, his, his public sort of persona quite slowly. I've only really seen one um, extended interview with him that he did with Dzeko in in Germany recently. But apart from that, he's not particularly outspoken publicly, as perhaps before him, Hassan Salihamidzic was, um, and, and, pre- and and previous figures before him. Again, you can debate as to whether that was a good thing for Bayern or not, whether Salihamidzic is speaking out all the time was a good thing, probably not. But um, I, I, I suspect that the more, you know, potentially, more, the more Christoph Freund settles into his public-facing role as a sporting director, um, to maybe, yeah, maybe he can sort of take on some of the questions which Thomas Hugo is being, um, you know, finding himself having to field. Particularly because Tuchel still necessarily operating with the team which he would like to uh, have had put together. Um, there is that mitigating factor still, because um, by all accounts, at least on the training pitch, things do seem to be going quite well. Um, Thomas Muller, for all his um, yeah pretty explosive comments in his interview, nevertheless made a point. Maybe he was just playing politics and saying that on the training pitch it's fine. His problem's not the coach. He made a point of saying that. Uh, by all accounts, it was okay in training in the week up to the game. Um, but he, for, for Miller to say it's not the coach's fault, but then to talk about having no freedom to play football, overcomplicating things in their heads, not having the freedom to play the way Leverkusen did. Having no fun. That, I felt that was no a really fun. telling yeah, comment. Yeah, exactly. But that, but that, that isn't indirect. Surely yeah. that's indirectly, even yeah. subconsciously, in good school. Of course it's a commentary it is. on the you, environment, right? Yeah. Like it's, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, let's just dive into this now. We were going to do Alonso, but we'll do Alonso after this because it's probably worth just kind of segueing into this point and talking about Tuchel's situation at Bayern because there's a lot of talk on social media. We had a lot of Bayern fans in our subscriber chat 
calling for his head, you know, bloodthirsty, as you would expect from football fans at full time. Um, there was some pictures taken in the, the way ground or in the way stand, I think it was, and it, it, it said, correct me if I'm wrong, of saying no to call out. Let's just discuss that in itself. You know, is uh, basically, as, as as Matt mentioned, and we can hit the nail on the head, whichever way we want, but, you know, is this issue Tuchel or is this issue Bayern? Um, because, you know, it seems like it's, it's always a very, very easy thing to say. Let's just sack the head coach, wipe the slate clean and start again. But, I mean, Seb, where do you land on this? No, well, I, I think if you're going to go down the sack the coach pathway, like, you got to you got to have something, you got to have an alternative to propose. Like, okay, so you sack the coach and who do you replace him with? Like I saw, like, Jose Mourinho's name mentioned. Conveniently, Mourinho has let it be known that he's learning German. He's thinking, grow up. Like, <laughs> Jose, Jose Mourinho is, is a is a coach for teams who want a bit of an ego stroke. Like, you want the big personality. Like, the idea of him in that environment is ludicrous absolutely ridiculous uh, i mean i'd want to see it because i think weird stuff would happen that we could talk about but as a practical solution no not at all so like what is the option and also like i'm can i just say by the way i'm firmly on the Mourinho to the bundesliga bandwagon uh but i agree that maybe munich's not the best place for him well i mean it, it, it's also if we're gonna if you're gonna sack someone you're sacking on the basis that they've built a team and it doesn't work and it's not effective. I don't believe that this side is a reflection of the way that Thomas Tuchel wants to play uh, based on the teams he's created elsewhere. I also have no sense of Bayern Munich's dimensions as a football club or what their their five-year strategy is or what, like, if you, the January transfer is a really good example, right? Because you, you have shortages in your team and it feels like previous Bayern Munichs would have previous Bayern Munich hierarchies would have a strategy for who is to fill which position over a long period of time. And what you have instead is Eric Dyer because he's, in, he's available. Eric Dyer wasn't good enough to play for Tottenham. I mean, it breaks my heart to say that because I'm a Tottenham fan, but it's true. Uh, wasn't having his contract renewed. So he was he he was he was he was low-hanging fruit to kind of a plug a gap in your, in your squad. Uh, Sasha Bowie, okay, uh, talented guy, but um, uh, Turkey to to the Bundesliga is a little bit of a jump, um, especially if you're going to shove him straight into the middle of a title decider. Um, Masraoui, not really sold on it. And actually, if you go back a few years and you look at how some of the signings have, have been treated and the lack of a tune that, that, that Bayern have been able to get out of them, Gravenberch is the one I feel like that has really under-delivered on where he was. So we have all of these moving parts and the answer to the question cannot be let's have some more fluidity, right? Which is what a new coach is. In the abstract sense, that is what you're doing. You're, you're, you're saying, right, well, we're going to start again now. We're going to bring something different in and another unknown fact. We don't know how well it's going to go. And and there's no, you know, if you go back five years and Julian Nagelsmann is doing wonderful things at RB Leipzig, okay, that's a little bit of a different conversation because you've got something interesting to invest in. But there is nothing there that is obviously going to improve by it. That I can see, at least. I, I might be wrong, but there's... There's no obvious solution. And that's that's the question you have to answer before you go down the kind of right uh, Tuchel Rouse, which uh, for me is very reactionary. Yeah. The, the the interesting thing is that Tuchel's record for Bayern is actually still better than Nagelsmann's. He's, he's averaging 2.3 points per game in the Bundesliga, where Nagelsmann averaged 2.19. Um, I've got an interesting comparison for you here, Matt, which has just kind of popped into my head. I was trying to, as I was gathering my thoughts and listening to what Seb was saying and, and thinking about Bayern and I completely agree with what Seb's saying. You look at the kind of players that they brought in over the last kind of couple of years, how they haven't quite gelled, how they've kind of swung from one type of head coach to another type of head coach to another, um, all while the kind of spine of that team, in my opinion, has been a long-term decline for some time, whether it's Manuel Neuer, um, Leon Goretzka, maybe Yosha Kimmich, you can make an argument for Serge Gnabry, maybe even Alfonso Davies, uh, whether that's physical, technical, or just simply, you know, he's not he's not he's not interested in playing for Barn anymore. It all seems a bit like post Ferguson Man United to me. Even but instead of the head coach being the guy who's moved on and left that power shift, it's maybe, you know, the Sebastian Hodes or or or, or Romanega or something like that. It feels like there's a lot of money being spent. There's a lot of big stars being brought in. 
but there's not a lot of joint up thinking and as a result we've just kind of got this convoluted mess of superstars in a team that don't look like they're making they're having fun or winning games there's a little bit of a mess a little bit of insecurity a little bit of a restructuring going on um i wouldn't i, I absolutely would not go as far as to compare it to Manchester United you know, post post Ferguson, I think that's a that's just a no. that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's a that's a circus on a whole other level. Like I said, it's carnival time. It's been carnival in Manchester for ten years. <laughs> anyway, that's a different topic. Um, yeah. yeah, there is a restructuring going on by it, absolutely. And um, they are looking to move on. We've talked about the restructuring in the hierarchy on several on several podcasts, the movements at the top, and how it didn't work with the whole Sally Hamidzic, Oliver Kahn, um, Axis now they're we, you know, they're, they're going again with uh, young Christian Driesen in that role, potentially Max Abel coming into the spot director or the direct off sport role. We've, we've talked about that before. Like I said earlier, Christoph Freud still growing into his role as sporting director. All those, um, you know, the, the, all those roles, plus also the role of uh, Michael Nepper, the chief scout, is he going to take, is he going to go? All of those issues need to come into place first, I think, before you start demanding uh, Tuchel's house. And again, I repeat, that's not to say that he's without blame. He absolutely was to blame on, on Saturday, for example. Um, if in the meantime, while that restructuring is all going on, and I, I trust Bayern to get it right, they absolutely have farm for it. Uh, Bayern's history is littered with, well, I say littered, two major examples of high-profile failure in 1999 and 2012, followed very shortly later by, you know, era defining historical success um so i wouldn't write by minikov completely um yeah they, they, they are in they are in that process of restructuring it if that if that means that for the first time in 12 years Bayern don't win the league or indeed don't win a single trophy it's absolutely not the end of the world um it should have happened last year if we're being honest and you know uh, that was down to the Dortmund that, that it didn't it's not the end of the world it doesn't mean that thomas Huckel is a is a complete failure it doesn't mean that Bayern's restructuring is com- is completely behind the pace and destined to fail. It, it, the, the draw is very much still out. Um, yeah, I, I would be tempted just to leave the toys in the pram for the time being. I, 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 as tempting as it is, and I, I, I understand the reaction, particularly after Saturday, because they were diabolical uh, on and off the pitch. Uh, and the, the reactions of the of the various Bayern officials surrounding the surrounding the game. The performance from the players themselves on the pitch, even the away support seemed resigned to the fact that you know, they're they're all singing, uh, "You won't, you won't win the league." You know, only Bayern will win the league, but they, they didn't believe it. Um, but if that doesn't happen for one year, it's not the end of the world. I might push back on that slightly, just because you're absolutely right. Of course, we shouldn't be throwing the toys at the pram, and hyperbole is, you know, reserved for. Um, people like us, I suppose, who talk on podcasts and try and get people to listen to them. But, you know, if you do kind of step back and look at this team, um, you know, they won the league by tripping over the finish line, but it's the lowest points total they've ever picked up since 2011. I checked before we were on air. Um, they haven't got past the quarterfinals of the Champions League since 2020. Uh, they look nothing, they don't look anywhere near doing that this season. In fact, a lot of people are predicting they could struggle against Lazio. And, you know, yes, they brought in Christoph Freund, they're going to try this new system of bringing in young players, but, you know, the reason I've mentioned the Man United comparison is because every single season they just chop and change. You know, one minute it's Sally Hamovic, one minute it's Christoph Freund, one minute it's Nagels and one minute it's Tuchel. If it's not going to be Tuchel, who who, who comes in next season? Um, but, I, but I don't think it has been a, um, a regular chopping and change. There's only actually been two big changes. One of them has been to bring in the Sally Hamidzic Oliver Kahn axes, and that then failed, and they still won the league, but but has been judged to have been a failure, and I I accept that it wasn't working out, um, and the second change has been to move on from that, what we have now, so I don't think the argument that they chop and change all the time actually holds actually holds water. Yeah, well, I guess the other thing as well is that unlike Man United, Bayern can actually afford to just kind of drift for a while, sir, because. You know, for all we love the German football, it's obviously not as competitive as the Premier League where there's two or three kind of super clubs waiting to kind of step into their hole. Whereas, you know, the club we'll talk about in a moment who are stepping in this season, but the likes of Dortmund and Leipzig haven't been able to take advantage of Dortmund, of Barnes kind of malaise over the years. 
No, 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 I suppose not. I mean, uh, the one thing I'll add to this is that, like, I feel it's quite interesting the kind of the, the conversation around Harry Kane in that that in itself represented a little bit of a departure from kind of traditional thinking. Go and, right, go and break the German transfer record because you can and because this player is available for the, you know, in an unusual situation. Um, it's a very, um, I find it, I think quite disheartening to to watch the response to to Bayern's situation from back in England because without Kane's form, without the contributions of Lewis Sonet, who I, I think has been really, really good this season for, for much of it, like Bayern are nowhere near Leverkusen. And like yesterday's game is not even really a title decider. It's a kind of Bayern are 10 points back rather than uh, two. Um, and I'm trying to think of it in terms of what it means for the Bundesliga I mean like in terms of how valuable is it for someone like Harry Kane to succeed in Germany um, to succeed in the Champions League if he doesn't do that in this Bayern Munich team whether it's representative of what they are generally or not is that quite damaging to German football I, I don't know I, I'm, I'm posing a question because it's been on my mind since the end of like, yesterday's game and because there are so many people who seem to tune into yesterday's game without having watched anything that preceded it well, any of the games that preceded have just kind of dropped in to have a little bit of a laugh at, at Kane's misfortune and Eric Dyer. It's um, it's just an interesting situation. I didn't answer your question in any way at all, Stefan, but it, I, I thought I'd just get that in there. That's so, right. You chose to just talk about two Tottenham players. It was players, the only which... place that was going to fit. And I had to have my say. I, I, it, but it's frustrating. It's really frustrating. Like I've seen Kane come over. I've seen him adapt to Bavarian life really well, embrace living in Germany in a way that English people j generally don't um, playing really well him also being one of the only reasons that Bayern are actually competitive in my mind because I think if you take Kane away and you take Sané away they have been absolutely awful in so many other different areas of the pitch um, and so now you get people kind of turning up in February five months into the season and, and judging it on a, on a single 90 minute period it just it does my head in it drives me crazy